Welcome to Drama Free Healthy Living with Jess Cording. I'm your host, Jess Cording. I'm a registered dietitian, health coach, and author, and I'm here to help you streamline your wellness routine and establish a sane, more balanced relationship with food and fitness so you can reach your goals without losing your mind. On this podcast, we'll talk about nutrition, exercise, self care, mindset, and more. I'll be bringing you interviews and expert insight on the topics that matter to your health and wellness. Hi, and welcome back to the Drama Free Healthy Living podcast. I'm your host, Jess Corday. Today, I am so excited you're joining me for this episode. I, you guys know I love talking about brain stuff. So we are chatting with Dr. Jeff Carr. So I, I love nerding out on the, like the brain and ways of, of learning and harnessing our brain power. And um, so Jeff Karp, PhD, is a Harvard Medical School professor and MIT bioengineer dedicated to translating nature's wisdom into both medical therapy and self-help tools to reclaim your energy and attention. So I was especially excited to talk to, to Jeff today because, you know, these tools have actually helped him in his own life. You know, he struggled with ADHD as a child and really found inspiration in nature to channel creativity and focus and actually we talked about this in the episode, co-found over a dozen companies that have raised over $600 million. He also runs the CARP Lab at um, Mass General Hospital. And he has a new book out called Lit, where he outlines critical lessons where we can learn from nature and apply these lessons to our lives. So we talk about, you know, his experience, you know, growing up with ADHD and really an aha moment he had about how to unlock his own attention and, and learning capacity. Um, we talk about how to make your ADHD or other neurodiversity a, a superpower. You know, we talk about what we can learn from nature. We talk about things like activation energy of daily tasks and how to make it easier to do what we want to do. This this episode is full of wisdom, and I really hope that you enjoy this one. This was a joy to record, and I'm really happy to share it with you guys. So uh, without further ado, Jeff, welcome to the podcast. Hey, so nice to meet you. Uh, I'm I'm really excited we're talking today because I I've been doing the work that I do for you know I've been in this field now about 15 years and I've come across so many people who you know I, I think we often assume that everybody you know there's like one way of doing things or like that we all kind of have the same way of like focusing and thinking like our process but it can be so different and I. I ended up actually, you know, I've been very vocal on in my work about my own experience navigating some like cognitive issues related to PTSD. And I ended up marrying someone who was ADHD. And it's been really interesting to learn our different ways of communicating and working and what we both need. And so I was really fascinated to learn about your work and your story. I would love to know, though, because I just mentioned you know, ADHD and that's something I know we're talking about today. But for those who might not be familiar, with, with this, you know, what is ADHD? Yeah, ADHD. So uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. I'm not too happy with the word disorder. And maybe we'll come back to that in a, in a moment or two. But usually people who have ADHD express certain patterns, patterns of distractibility, inattentiveness. They can be impulsive at times. They can have bursts of energy. You know, some people call that that hyper, and uh, maybe also can can mister m sort of misunderstand social cues, and so you know, kind of interrupting people um, during conversations and things like that. So if I do that, I apologize in <laughs> advance. You know, I totally don't mean to. And then, but the flip side is, is that, you know, people with ADHD and, and, you know, a bit of a generalization, but generally they can hyper-focus, especially on the things that, um, you know, when they're following their curiosity and they can also have expressions of creativity that can be, you know, quite profound. And then also uh, there tends to be a skill of being able to lateral think. So kind of combine ideas from different spaces and kind of meld them together. But the word disorder, so you can kind of see like, I feel like it's, you know, some people, I think, I think what happens is, is that it seems like a disorder early in life because in the kind of classical education system, you know, children who have ADHD are, are typically, you know, called lazy or troublemakers or so it really feels, I think, to a lot of teachers as if it is a disorder. But generally later in life, if those kids have had the right support 
and mentorship and guidance, they can really be incredibly um, productive and create a lot of value for, bring a lot of value to society. And you know, for you growing up, you know, what was your experience navigating that as a child and growing into you know an adolescent and into adulthood? Well, I didn't know I had ADHD. My parents didn't know. My teachers didn't know. Nobody really knew. And um, what happened is in the second grade, I was just struggling. I was, you know, sitting at the back of the class, frustrated, angry, not being able really to understand anything. You know, it, it, my mom tried phonics and cue cards. I couldn't sound out words. And the teacher pulled my parents aside at the end of the year and said, you know, I'd like to hold Jeff back a year to repeat the second grade. And my parents negotiated with that teacher so that I would spend the summer, you know, kind of catching up. And what happened was actually uh, one day I went in um, to meet with my tutor and she asked me a question. I forget that question, but I remember the next one she asked, which is, how did you think about that? And when she asked that, it was literally like a light bulb went on. It was this transformative experience for me because no one had ever asked me that. And it was like a window into thinking about thinking. And I had always been told, you know, think before you speak, think before you speak, but I didn't have a process to do that. And so this kind of opened up this like canvas in my mind from which I could kind of create these constructs and, you know, kind of think before I, I actually spoke. And so that was, you know, a huge step forward towards me towards for developing um, these tools, these coping strategies that eventually became um, lit life ignition tools, which, which is a, a book that uh, I've been working on the last seven years that's coming out in April. Wow, I love that. And I, I can actually kind of relate to that. I was a little, I was a bit older, um, but I like I had been a really like just good student, had the easiest time learning. And then after a, a traumatic experience as a teenager, suddenly it was like I could not focus. I couldn't retain information. I couldn't learn the way I was used to learning. And something that was a game changer for me. And I, I brains are so fascinating with like the way we process information because it can be so different from one person to another. But I, I found that if I told stories about the things I was trying to learn, it helped me somehow like get into that that information, um, you know, and that when I got, you know, I, I did not study nutrition the first time around. By the time I got to graduate school and had to take like advanced organic chemistry and biochemistry, like on all my exams, I was like writing little narratives about like the molecules and stuff. Cause otherwise I was just, I couldn't unlock that information the same way. And it was, I remember I fought it at first, but I was like, you know what, this is what's working. I don't care. All that matters is that I learned the information. Yeah, but, I, th I think that, you know, the education system, like the, the classical system is very two dimensional, I would say. Yeah. And uh, and so, you know, it's it's really very few instances where you have the experiential learning opportunities where you're kind of out in nature and engaging and, you know, doing active things. And so it's almost like there needs to be a bit of a, a push a force that needs to be applied um, because you don't have like a, um, you're not curious about the work. And if the teacher isn't, you know, charismatic and really passionate about what they're teaching, then, then what you're learning really tends to stay in those two dimensions and just isn't that interesting. And so we need to develop tools in order to sort of get excited somehow, or, you know, kind of figure out how we can activate our minds to be open to learning that material. Yeah, I love that. I, you know, I work a lot with people who are trying to get into a good fitness routine. And, you know, something that's been very helpful for my husband, um, that some of my patients who have similar, similar challenges with, with ADHD have found like some of the virtual reality workouts are so great because it's just like, it's like gamifying it. It's more fun. Like it's been really cool to see. Like that's just one example of a tool that I've been really excited to see people getting to take advantage of. But I want to, Go back to something you said about nature. So tell us a little bit about just, you know, because this is something like we have research on this, you know, but it can be really hard to like get that time, make that time is probably a better word. But can you tell us a little bit about how you found inspiration in nature and sort of how that was really helpful for you? 
Yeah, absolutely. In fact, you know, there's three things that actually come to mind. Like one is my experience in nature. And there was kind of like, I'll, I'll, I'll tell, tell you kind of briefly about that. The second, I think, is the science, which you've kind of, you know, alluded to. And then the third is, you know, what can we we do to connect more deeply with nature, especially, you know, when we're all living in these concrete jungles these days. And, you know, it's kind of hard to see too much, you know, hard, hard to see green around us. But um, so what happened was, is that actually in, in the third grade, we moved out to the country. And, um, and this was at a time when I was, you know, I was really struggling. But something that w- happened was really incredible was, so the bus, I'd take a bus to school because we're out in the country and it would drop me off at the end of our driveway. Now our driveway, we didn't even call it a driveway, we called it a laneway because it was a thousand feet long. It was oh. carved through a forest. It was like, had to walk over a bridge. So there was like a creek <laughs> and then up a hill. And then there's a massive farmer's field like, in our backyard. And so what would happen is I get off the bus and, you know, I'd spent all day kind of struggling, trying to figure out what was going on in school and just like frustrated and drained and walking home and just kind of on either side of me, looking into the trees and just listening to hear the water from the creek and and being able to, you know, see all these patterns of leaves and branches and 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 just the sounds and it just it took my attention off of what was in my mind which tended to be a lot of rumination while I was on the bus kind of coming home and i just felt this sense of calm and so i really i would say at an early age you know i was probably like 8 at the time or so had uh, developed a deep connection with nature and i really feel like it was almost like nature was was hugging me in a way you know <laughs> after what I had been through during the day. And and so, um, and that really stuck with me. And, you know, there's all kinds of different stories to tell about my interactions with 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 nature. Actually, there is one, one quick story, if it's okay to tell you, is I was walking home one day and there was actually, I saw something kind of moving from in a tree and I looked over and there was a bat, you know, hanging upside down. I kind of <laughs> got close and I could see its teeth. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what it was doing, but I just remember at that moment, all of the thoughts in my mind were like, they were squeezed out of my mind. Like it was almost like my brain was being pinched and all I could think about was the bat. And I ran home and I told my, my family about it. And I started, you know, reflecting on it later on because I'd had this experience in with, with a tutor about thinking about thinking. So I had developed this kind of ability to have awareness, you know, of, of, of things. And I just thought to myself, you know, well, I wonder if I can apply this at school. Like, could I pinch out the other thoughts in my mind mm-hmm. so that I could focus more on what the teacher was saying? And and that actually evolved into a tool that I like to call pinch your brain, which I use all the time. I mean, I use it every day in in my, um, in my work in my lab. But uh, so that was really transformative uh, for me, the ability to really just use my intention to focus my attention to think or redirect my thinking. So the science, actually, there's a lot of um, scientific studies now that have demonstrated and, you know, uh, highly support this idea that when you go into nature, that there's a switch from the sympathetic nervous system to the parasympathetic nervous system. So essentially, a lot of us are in this kind of fight or flight mode throughout the day. And, you know, it's not really helped by this digital age that we're in. And and in fact, you know, when when we're online, a lot of the time, it's actually, you know, our, we're, we're, we have like screen apnea where we stop breathing and we, you know, it's kind of activating our minds as if we're sort of encountering various threats in our environment. And so when we go into nature, it, our breathing rate is reduced, our heart rate goes down, our blood pressure goes down, our sense of wellness is, you know, goes up. So, and, and there's been a lot of studies to demonstrate this at, you know, many different levels, brain imaging studies, as well as you know, they have just so many different types of studies, actually. And, um, and then what I what also I find is really fascinating is the research also shows that if you're, let's say, in a concrete jungle, and you can't get out to a park or, or you know, some green space, that just putting on a nature video, and sort of focusing on it for a few minutes, you know, five minutes, 10 minutes, can have similar effects uh, that can switch from that sympathetic to the parasympathetic nervous system and really start to you know, have people feel more calm and and at ease, Um, maybe not to the same magnitude as actually being out in nature, but it can, it definitely can help. I love that. And I think that for for somebody who maybe, you mentioned the concrete jungles that we all live in, and I lived in New York City for 13 years. I was in Boston for four years before that. And moving to 
an area where there was green space was like, oh my God, it was such, like, it's such a, a different way of doing things internally. But for somebody who, you know, maybe has a hard time making nature a priority in their life or part of their life, you know, maybe they're busy or they live in an urban area or it's just not a habit. Like, what are a few ways that maybe you would recommend that they, they do that? Yeah. So I think, I think, you know, the one is, is to, to put on some nature videos or to, you know, even like watch, there's a, t- a ton of documentaries in and around the nature area, um, you know, about the ocean or jungles or, you know, indigenous w- ways of being and, and, and different ways of, of sort of, you know, living and, you know, lot, lots of different things like that. But one can also put on music, like there's nature sounds, you know, if you subscribe to Spotify or others. So that can also help. And that there's studies to demonstrate that that actually can can help, you know, flip the switch um, from the sympathetic to the parasympathetic system. And another thing that I do, which I find really helpful is, you know, I tend to, or, you know, there's been many years where, you know, I just kind of, I would walk my dogs or, you know, around the neighborhood. And, and in fact, actually, what I used to do, it was, um, it was crazy because, and, and what I used to do is I would walk outside with my dogs and watch Netflix. Okay. This was going back like many years ago. And I, I developed this awareness of what I was doing, this pattern that I had gotten into. So I'd be outside and I would literally be focused on a screen as I'm not even paying attention to the dogs. So, you know, when COVID hit, it was this unintentional pause for all of us. And I started to reflect on my habits and realize that there were a bunch of patterns that I really needed to, to update. And so what I did was, is I made the, the, you know, I decided that I was not going to look at the screen anymore and that I was actually going to interact with the dogs on the walks. And that I was going to try to talk to them the entire walk. So I would go outside and I would, and that, you know, initially I was a little bit like kind of concerned about like what the neighbors would say, but I kind of got, (laughs) I got over that after a little while. And it was amazing to me because they, I would notice the dogs actually would look back at me. Like they would look at me at certain times during the walk, like trying, you know, making that eye contact when it happened, then they had this burst of energy. Like I noticed there was a shift in them when we made eye contact, which kind of made me think like, oh my gosh, look at all those times I could have done that, you know, when I was out watching Netflix. And now what I've done, I've kind of taken this like a little bit of a step further, which is I really feel there's something about touching things in nature. And so even like, you know, when I pass a tree, I might put my hand on it. Sometimes, you know, I'll close my eyes and just sort of have that experience or, you know, I'll I'll touch some of the branches or I'll move some rocks around or put some rocks in and around the trees or make like a little design. So I feel like that's another way to connect with nature is that, you know, it's not just about sort of looking and hearing, but we can actually touch, you know, use our sense of touch and, you know, just sort of picking up a rock and holding it and sort of looking at it and, or putting your hand on a tree and sort of feeling the texture, like that's connecting with nature too. Yeah. I, I love that so much. And it, it, it definitely, you can feel the change in your nervous system when, like, well, as you were just describing, but like, I remember being skeptical about it, you know, so many years living in the city, I was like, what am I supposed to do? Like go to Central Park and put my feet in the dirt. And then you know, years later, living in a, somewhere with a backyard, I was like, ah, I understand. I'm sorry. I was so like, you know, dismissive of that. Um, but those moments with the dogs, like when you connect with the animals, the, the, I, oh, I love the little faces when they look at you and mm-hmm. it's just it's the best. <laughs> You know, another thing that I do is so, especially like when it's late at night, kind of their last walk of the day is I'll walk backwards so that I can see them walking towards me. And, <laughs> uh, and I've just found that's kind of like a fun, fun thing to, to, to do. You know, they kind of look at me like a little bit differently, like when I'm doing that. And sometimes they, they just kind of race, you know, to race in front. But, um, I find that's just like another, there's so many things that we can experiment with in our yeah. day and there's just so many possibilities. And so I'm always looking for new things that I can sort of test out. And, you know, when we're on the, while we're on the, the nature theme here, the other thing too, is, is that, um, I think that, so, you know, I, I, I read and watched, read a bunch of, of, um, you know, things online and, and been, been watching podcasts and things about gratitude. And I've always thought like, okay, well, how do I bring more gratitude in my life? But the challenge I found is that I didn't really have a process for doing it. And, and so I was at a friend's place earlier in the summer and I was just a, a, like four or five, four or five guys. And he said, okay, I want to show you something 
Um, and this totally connects to nature. So that's where I'm going. And he said, okay, he, he was trying to practice gratitude. And he said, I want to show you this practice. So he said, okay, everyone put your hands like over your food. So we did that. And he said, okay, we're going to think about each ingredient and what it tastes like. And so we each, you know, and what I found is actually, I've been practicing it ever since every meal and my ability to sense that sort of what the taste is, is improved over time. And then he said, we're going to think about all the energy that went into this, all the energy from the sun and all the microbes and all the regeneration that had to occur and, you know, the photosynthesis and then all the people who cultivated it, the farmers and the people who transported it and prepared it. And now this food is going to become us. That's what he said at the end. And to me, it was like this portal into gratitude. It was a process for practicing gratitude. That's like really an, er, it's like an easy kind of on-ramp. And, and so I've been doing it. And now what I do is I not only just do it, but I look outside at the trees and sort of like, if I can go outside and, and I might eat when I'm outside, I'll do that. You know, it's hard to do that when it's like in a snowstorm and you know, it's really <laughs> right. cold in Boston, but, but I, I like to do that or, or at least just be sitting inside kind of looking at the trees. And I feel like that has helped me to connect more with nature. And I feel as I've kind of developed this practice of gratitude, I have gratitude for all of nature. And when I'm on the walks, I, I feel like I'm looking at nature differently, like the trees and the squirrels and the birds. And it just has opened up this new way of interacting. And, and I think it, you know, towards creating like this interconnected mindset, which I think is just really helpful for all of us to improve our well-being and our, our mental health. I love that term and the interconnected mindset. That is, that's such a lovely way of describing that. Yeah, I think. And so one of the things that I think about now, so, 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 so this practice has evolved for me, um, as I think all things really do. I mean, I think that's kind of like the essence of our beings is that we're, we're always evolving and, and, you know, our environment's always changing. And, but the one of the ways I, I think about the interconnectedness and, and is that over half of the oxygen that we breathe is actually coming from microbes in the ocean that are smaller than a millimeter in size. So, you know, like a standard eraser on the end of a pencil might be like five millimeters. So you kind of give you a sense like one fifth of that size. That's where the, like the majority of the oxygen actually that we breathe is coming from the ocean. And so as I'm sort of eating, like, you know, having a meal, I'm looking at what's on my plate or in my bowl, you know, whatever it is. And I'm sort of thinking about that, like this life was supported by these creatures that are in the ocean. And to me, that's important because it can really help us to, to really think about that interconnected mindset. Like, you know, we needed the energy from the sun for the photosynthesis, for the plants to grow. We needed these, you know, the phytoplankton in the ocean to give us oxygen to breathe. Like it's all fully supportive. And when you start sort of realizing that and thinking about it and developing an awareness of it, it just, you start seeing the interconnectedness of everything in life. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I want, to, I want to shift gears a little bit because, um, you know, something that, you know, I and this is reminding me a little bit of what you were talking about earlier about how when, you know, maybe someone with ADHD or similar is, you know, really engaged in something, they're curious, you know, they're able to focus on on that thing. And it would be slightly different from what you mean specifically, but, you know, to give it some like vocabulary for, for some of us lay people to articulate and understand, you know, and that there's neural networks um, that you that you talk about and different ways that they can shake our brains awake, so to speak. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how that works? Sure, sure. So yeah, there's a lot, lot to say on that. So I'd say um, actually a few, few really key points. I think first of all is we're kind of getting to this point in, in, um, in time where we're realizing how much potential we really have. But at the same time, we're realizing that we're only using a small fraction of our human machinery. And, uh, you know, we know this from a lot of the new research that's coming out in, in, um, in, uh, you know, neuroscience type, type research. And, um, we have this incredible ability in our brains which is, you know, it's called neuroplasticity, essentially, which is like the ability to adapt, the ability to form new connections 
And every single thing that we hear or, or, or see or experience, we're actually rewiring our brains. And so this incredible, you know, energy source, this incredible power that we all have, you know, it, it's, it, it's there for us to tap into and to utilize. And I think that really, you know, we need to find tools that we can, you know, make part of our daily patterns or habits that we can turn to, to really unlock that potential, you know, that we all have within us. I love that. And I know we've been talking a little bit about, you know, nature and, you know, stimulating, um, you know, helping you think and come up with different ways of thinking, channeling creativity, focus. What about, so like a term, I, like you were to go back to talking about like, you know, childhood. Um, I remember there was always that kid in class and I, I was one of them. They were like, you have a big imagination, you know, kind of like said in like a, not like necessarily like the, the kindest way, but like, you know, oh, their heads in the clouds. But then as an adult, like that can actually be a really wonderful trait, you know, to have an imagination. But, you know, in a society that puts a lot of emphasis on productivity and, you know, making things, how, you know, what are some, some thoughts you have about how to turn imagination into, we'll say, innovation? Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I've thought thought a lot about this. And I think that, you know, and I, I think since I've also been practicing this, um, practicing gratitude, I tend to now, you know, when I go on an airplane, I say to myself, like, oh, my God, this is incredible, like that we're actually flying through the air like a bird, like it's unbelievable, you know, and it's it's kind of like, you know, when you start to look around and notice all of these innovations that have happened around us and, you know, being someone like, you know, I run a research laboratory and we develop a lot of technologies and then bring them into clinical trials and hopefully to, uh, to patients. And so I'm, I'm, you know, constantly living that innovation process. And, and, and to me, one of the, the, the really important aspects of that process is that we can dream up anything. But the challenge then is, okay, well, how do we put it into action, which I think is your question. And what I've realized is, is the way to do it is to find people who have complementary skill sets and who are also, you know, interested in, you know, working together and on that particular problem or technology. And when you start to bring people together, you kind of create this constellation of energies where that that actually leads to momentum and then people start to come up with ideas of how to develop prototypes and start testing it and so i would say the the strategy of moving from imagination to innovation is really about connecting like forming this you know interconnected network of people who have those complementary skill sets so that you can start to you know build something people getting excited and then once you start having prototypes being made you know, then that's an opportunity to try to find investment or, you know, seek funding to then do some of the, you know, larger uh, proof of concepts or, you know, scale what you're doing. And for background, I didn't, I didn't mention this, but, you know, one of the, one of the reasons I'm asking about this is, you know, that you have co-founded, what, over a dozen companies, correct? Yeah. Like that have been very successful. Like what, are there any things that you would share with our listeners that you have found helpful in making that possible? I know you just shared some really great Great nuggets of wisdom with us, but you know anything else that you want to add that you know you think has been helpful for you? Sure. Yeah, I got interested in entrepreneurship and and innovation when I was uh, in my PhD, actually, which I did in in Toronto. I had two advisors, mentors who were you know they had started companies and you know they were moving technologies from their lab into the companies, and then I did my postdoc at. MIT and specifically pick somebody who was, you know, extraordinarily prolific, um, Professor Bob Langer, who was actually a co-founder of Moderna and many other incredible companies. So I went to, to his lab and it was just amazing to see what was possible. And what happened though, was when I was coming out of his lab and starting my faculty position, I realized that I saw what was possible, which is very important because that kind of expands, you know, the range of possibilities kind of in your mind. But I realized that I didn't know how to translate. I didn't know how to, like, I didn't have the process for moving academic discoveries into products that could then help people. And um, so what I did was, is I sort of, you know, I'm kind of of the mindset that 
if I'm not good at something or if I don't know how to do something, it's probably because I'm just not engaging the right process. And so that kind of put me into this, you know, kind of press pause and put me into self-reflection mode. And then I kind of realized, well, maybe one thing that I could do is I'm in Boston. I have this, there's this incredible ecosystem of entrepreneurship here. And maybe if I could just, you know, get over my fear and hesitation and just start meeting with people in that ecosystem, maybe I could form relationships and, and, um, you know, then I could, instead of me having to learn how to, you know, move academic discoveries into, um, you know, to turn them into products and bring them to patients, I could kind of surround myself by people who knew how to do that. And so literally every two or three weeks, and I did this for over 10 years, I would meet with people in the entrepreneurial ecosystem in Boston. So like add in lawyers, corporate lawyers, reimbursement regulatory experts, and people in med tech and biotech and pharma and consumer tech. And the goal was not just to network, but was to actually form relationships. And what ended up happening, and, and the thing was actually at the time, it was I, I was writing grants. I was just starting my lab. I was failing miserably at writing grants. Um, I think, you know, I wrote, I think like a hundred grants in my first two and a half years and almost all of them were rejected. But, and you know, I could talk more about that too as a lesson in, in, in learning from failure. But I did make that commitment during that time to get out of the lab and not just writing these grants, but to in, you know, engage the community. And something really incredible happened, which is this formed this like like all of a sudden i had this informal advisory board that was establishing around me for my laboratory so anytime we started a new project or as we advance projects i could reach out to friends and colleagues and say hey you know if we did a if this moved to a clinical trial what would we have to compare to and then once we knew that we could include that in our early experiments to determine whether what we're doing is important or not or i could ask and say do you think this could be manufactured? Because a lot of technologies that come out of academia just can't, they're too complicated. They can't be manufactured. And so that's one of the key ways that I was able to, or processes that I engaged that really helped me to, you know, kind of target or move these academic discoveries into, you know, clinical trials. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing. And there's a lot to be said for like getting out and and meeting people and connecting. Like, I cannot tell you like, you know, when I when I first finished grad school, I remember like the gold standard at the time, like, you know, we were kind of conditioned because of our training. I think like, oh, well, now you go and you find a full time job in a hospital. That's what you're trained to do. And I remember, um, you know, I had just finished grad school. I had all this debt. I was like, well, the only job I the first job and the opportunity I had, the first thing with this opportunity is a part time role. And I was like, well, shit, I just need money. Just got to start working. So I, I did. And I was like, you know, because it was part time, you know, I didn't recognize at the time. I remember, you know, thinking like, oh, well, that's to figure out you know, another way to make money. But because of that, it got me, yeah, I started writing when I was still in grad school because after a breakup, I needed to still pay both our shares of the rent because I got the apartment. So that was what started getting me meeting like editors and media people. But, you know, in terms of like getting out in the dietetics community and starting to do public speaking, you know, it started as a necessity because I was like, well, I have to keep, I have to pay the bills. But I found that it really helped me build a network of different kinds of experts and, you know, being able to connect other people with each other. And that just became so valuable over time. I, you know, I didn't recognize it as it was happening, but it just was, you know, a weird blessing in disguise, you know, at the time. And you're 26 yeah. and you're like, I oh, just, just need to make money. I don't know what to do. But it was, it was, you know, setting me up for a lot of really great things later. You know, that's actually a tool that you're describing a tool actually that uh, I write about in this, this book lit called Get Bothered. Um, and it's really about tapping into motivation, um, you know, finding the cues that move us to act or, you know, when we change something and then realize that that we care. And and so there's, you know, I kind of see it as like a pain point, like at that time, like it seems you tell me this is right, but there was this pain point because you kind of came to this realization that, you know, you needed to find a job and you needed to make things work. And so that really, that was the motivation. That was the wind behind your sails that really, you know, enabled you to then sort of reach out to others and get beyond that fear and hesitation that you might otherwise have kind of held you back. Right. It's it's amazing what we do when we are motivated, right? Like, and then whenever I'm having difficulty starting something or doing something that's on my list of shoulds, I'm all, you know, I always ask myself now, like, why does this feel hard? What's mm. going on here? Like, what's, wh why does this thing feel hard and something else feels easy? And that's always very telling. 
Yeah, so I like to um, to think of that as activation energy. And so actually way back in, in chemistry, I, I learned about this activation energy, which essentially is like, let's say you have like two molecules and you put them in, let's say water and they don't interact, but then you heat it and you keep heating it. And eventually they kind of bombard into each other and they form like, you know, they bind together. And so the activation energy is sort of like the minimal amount of energy you needed to put into the system in order for a reaction to occur. And when I learned that, I started thinking like, wait a moment, I could probably apply that to my life. And what if I started thinking about everything in terms of activation energy? So it's kind of like, okay, if I want to go out and, 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 and meet somebody in the community, there's a certain activation energy for me to do it. Like I need to construct an email, I need to, you know, and I might fail. So that activation energy might be higher because I'm thinking about, oh, what if they don't respond or what if they reject me? You know, so the activation energy can be larger. So I like to think of it that way because then I can think, okay, well, what are the ways that I could reduce the activation energy? And one of the ways you actually just mentioned is, you know, if you're motivated, if you can tap into some level of motivation, you actually reduce the activation energy required to take the first step. But I think there's a lot of ways that we can actually break down that that activation energy. And maybe I'll just give a really quick, yeah, kind of simple example of something that happened to me earlier in the summer, which is... Um, so a friend of mine called me, Michael Gale, and he said, um, he was on his bike and he goes, Jeff, you know, being on my bike is my happy place. So he, that's what he said to me. And I was like, oh my God, I love, I love biking. And then I was like, why am I not biking? Like I just, why is it not high? Like it's like the summer and I have bike. So I was like, okay, I'm going to go for a bike ride that day. And then it, it didn't happen. And so I was like, okay, I've got to think about this in terms of activation energy. Okay. So what do I do to lower the activation energy? And I was like, okay, well, what if I just go and find my helmet and I hang it on the handlebar, you know? And I was like, okay, got, got that out of the way. And then I was like, okay, what else can I do? Okay, I'll clean up my bike. I'll put some air in the tires. I'm like, okay, I got that out of the way. What can I do next? I'll put the bike somewhere where I can't miss it. Like I'm going to see it every day when I walk out of my house. And then it was like this point where all I needed was 15 minutes of time to get on the bike and ride around the neighborhood a couple of times. And this past summer, I biked over a thousand miles. So, wow. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I, I find the question I ask myself a lot when I'm having difficulty doing something I want to do. I'm like, how can I make this part of my daily routine? Like, how can I build a habit around this so it doesn't feel like such an effort? And it, yeah, it looks different for, for all of us. I go through this a lot with my, my clients who are struggling with like making exercise. I don't know, I keep talking about exercise, but making that a habit or it comes up with food habits too. You know, if it's like changing up what you're doing for breakfast or changing your coffee order. Well, I don't usually like to touch people's coffee orders, but that's a very <laughs> sacred thing. But yeah, yeah, I think that, you know, there's so there's so much there. I, I think that what happens at least, that, you know, from personal experience is that I found I was setting, I was actually practicing not achieving my goals because I was setting the goals to be too high. Mm. And so then what happened was, and then with that, I'd be shaming myself that I wouldn't. So it actually just, dom there's this domino effect of not, so it's like you set this goal, but it ends up actually bringing me further down than it does up because it's just an unachievable goal. And what I realized is that by sort of setting the goal as just these incremental steps of reducing the activation energy, just like a little bit at a time, then and making making these sort of goals like super simple. It's like, you know, if someone wants to go, let's say to the gym and they haven't been to the gym in years, you know, it's this idea of like, okay, one day just put out your shoes. Then and, and don't let yourself do anything else. Just that, right? Like stop yeah. yourself there. The next day, put your shoes on and walk around the gym. The next day, go inside and talk to them, but don't, don't go on, like don't do it. And then, you know, it's going to get to the point where you're just so used to now achieving these mini goals. You're just like, I can do it. Like you're just like, you know, you're just ready to go. And I think that's can, can really help people to develop new patterns and new habits by practicing these sort of lower activation energy, you know, just reduce the activation energy, you know, bit by bit. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I think that's really, really valuable. I, I'm going to tell like everyone I know to listen to for the episode just for, for that, if nothing else. But I want to talk a little bit more specifically, um, just because it, it, it comes up a lot in my world, um, in my professional life, personal life you know, ADHD and, uh, and please correct my, my terminology, um, because I want to make sure I, I get it right. But would that, but would that mean like other similar underlying would it be neurodivergent conditions, neurodivergence? What would be the, what would be the right way to, to phrase that? Yeah, no, I think that's right. Yeah. I think, 
I think, you know, everybody is on a spectrum, right? And I think society, you know, primarily because of the education system, you know, we start to get used to this word average, but I really don't think there is an average. Um, and everybody has um, you know, incredible abilities to access this energy that's within all of us. And we all have these sort of tendencies of words like, you know, certain superpowers. And just in my experience of, you know, I've had people in my laboratory from 30 different countries, and I've actually in my lab structured it because, you know, we're trying to maximize our ability to move new technologies to patients, you know, as quickly as possible. I minimize the overlap in expertise of people in the lab. And so, you know, a lot of laboratories you hear of kind of like as these ivory towers, and they're just so focused in one particular area. In my lab, we've had, you know, all kinds of material scientists and biologists. We've had a gastrointestinal surgeon, a cardiac surgeon. We've had a dentist and, you know, people from 30 different countries. And I just feel there's this incredible energy that you get when you, you know, kind of have people that just come from different places and have different experiences and think differently, it just really increases. It not only creates a ton of energy in the group and ways to kind of learn from one another, but I think that what you can do with that type of a team is like incredible. And so we try purposely in the lab to maximize the neurodiversity of the team members. That is so cool. And that makes so much sense. So if there is somebody out there who is listening and they're, you know, feeling kind of down on themselves because maybe they struggle with ADHD or some other, you know, form of neurodiversity that, you know, maybe has been challenging for them, you know, in traditional, you know, education systems or workplaces, you know, if they want to make that their superpower, you know, do you have any tips that you would share with them or things that you want, want them to know? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, I spend a lot of time and it took me time to kind of come to this, but I spent a lot of time really trying to figure out what I was curious about. And I feel like that, you know, our curiosities are really like this enormous superpower that we all have access to at any moment. And and sometimes it's masked, especially in this sort of digital age where we have all these algorithms that are pulling us in these different directions. And we're kind of unsure as to what we like or don't like. And it just seems like we like everything, you know, but, but I, I think that that the more we can tap into our curiosity, then the more we can lead with our curiosity and the more then we'll be able to like turn that into a superpower. And one of the ways that I have found to, to help tap into that powerful, you know, source of energy, the, our curiosity is through asking questions. And actually, when I was in, I'll just give you one example, but when I was, when I, an example of how I learned that asking questions is a skill and a skill that we can actually improve on. So when I went and did my grad work at University of Toronto, I would go to these seminars and would be grad students around me and professors, and they would ask these incredible questions. And I'd be thinking to myself, like, why don't I ask those questions? Like, those questions don't even come to my mind. Like, why? Like, what's wrong with me? Like, I, you know, I started to kind of shame myself about it. And then I thought, okay, well, maybe I need to find a process that works for me in order to figure out how to ask those questions. And so I thought about it. I thought about it, which to me is actually very important. You know, like it was like this press pause to reflect on something that I want to do and try to figure out, okay, what's the process to do it? So I came up with this idea that, okay, what if I go to seminars and I write down the questions that everybody asks? And so I went to the seminars and literally at the end of every seminar, I just write the questions as fast as I could. And I did that for several months. And then at some point I went through the pages of questions and I was like, oh my gosh, there's patterns here. Like there were like four or five categories of patterns of these questions. And by cluing into that, then when I went to the next seminar, I could kind of think about those categories of questions as they were giving the talk. And then all of a sudden, those questions popped into my mind. They became, and so I became better at asking questions by making it almost like, you know, kind of steadying in a way the questions that other people are engaging, the questions that other people were asking. And so I think that, you know, if people want to sort of lead more with their curiosity, they can get there by asking questions. And if they want to figure out how to ask questions or ask like different types of questions, 
you can observe the questions that other people around you are asking, and you can even just, you know, write them down and then kind of reflect on them. And I think that's one way to really kind of unlock your, your superpowers. I love that so much. Thank you for sharing that with us. Now, I want to thank you for coming on today. I have just a couple more questions that I always ask my guests. And one of those questions is, so if people want to connect with you, learn more about your work, buy your books, what is the best way for them to do so? Sure. Um, just in the process of setting up um, a website, which will be uh, jeffcarp.com. So you can go there. Um, and then um, the book that's coming out is called um, Lit Life Ignition Tools. And it'll be available, I think, at uh, most of the major um, retailers. So you can check it out there. And we will be sure to link to all of that in the show notes. So that way, when the book is out there, website is up, it is all ready to go. Thank you. And then one more question for you, which I ask all my guests. Um, this podcast, this podcast I can talk today is called Drama Free Healthy Living. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I love asking my guests this question because there are so many different ways to interpret it. And that question is, what does healthy living mean to you today at this moment in time? Yeah. So I think about healthy living and, you know, wellness, not as a, not as a particular thing that you get to, but I think of it more as a path that you're on. And so, you know, so for example, if you take somebody who hasn't exercised in a long time and maybe, you know, isn't eating the best foods, I think, you know, if they take a step forward towards, um, you know, towards just developing an awareness and sort of thinking like, okay, I really want to do better. And they start to potentially, you know, like lower the activation energy to take that first step. To me, that is, you know, they're on that path. And I would say that's healthy living. That's, that's really what it's all about is getting on the path. It's not, I don't see it as a destination. I see it as a path. Amazing. I love that so much. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Yeah. So Jeff, thank you for coming on the show today. It's been a joy talking to you and learning from you. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. I've really enjoyed this conversation and yeah, thank you for that. Yeah. And can't wait to share your book with everybody and all you guys who are out there listening on your devices. Maybe you're out for a walk in nature or I don't know, maybe you're on your commute or you're cleaning, doing dishes, whatever it is. I hope you found today's conversation insightful. And if you like what you hear, please consider subscribing. Leave us a, review, a five-star review maybe on Apple Podcasts. They do matter and help me continue to bring you great guests like Jeff Carp today. As always, guys, have a wonderful day and we'll talk soon. Thank you for listening to Drama-Free Healthy Living with Jess Cording. We'll see you next time.